I myself uh, am going to try to give you all a short overview of what the legalization of medical cannabis means so that we all have a common basis to start from and so that we can discuss the topic with our high caliber guests here so that we can discuss what legalization actually means. So my impression is that with the reviewed Narcotics Act in Switzerland, we've, had, we've seen a real change of paradigms. And in 1975, cannabis was a forbidden substance. So by no means could you use it. This only changed in 2011 when cannabis was made a controlled substance. From then on, it was basically possible to apply for exemptions for the use in research, but also for patients so that they could consume cannabis containing THC. However, this was a difficult way to go. So far, it has been necessary that you had a permit by the Federal Office of Public Health and for patients, this means that they need to have a disease that cannot be cured otherwise and that all other ways of treatment had been used before. So this is not a legalized state. Uh, it is a situation full of hurdles and with the legal review, lots of things will now be changed. And the goal that the politicians have is to promote research in the field of cannabis medication. You may know that in Switzerland not much research was done about cannabis drugs in the past. That was because you needed an exemption for that, special permits, and that is why it was simply not attractive in the past to be active in the field also as a company. And this will now also be changed with the reviewed act. And this situation that we had in the past was also reflected by the public office of uh, public health's um, study. This study was a health technology assessment, and they wanted to find out whether worldwide there are enough studies available in order to prove that THC-containing cannabis can be effective for certain indications. And the result of this assessment was that the institute mandated with this study stated that there's simply not enough data on that available worldwide, not enough medical studies in order to prove that cannabis is effective for certain indications. And at the same time, the Institute said that there was not enough data to state that cannabis was not effective. There's just not enough foundation available to make a statement. That's a very special finding. And uh, this also indicates that now um, legalization must happen. Because in the course of legalization, many things will change. You no longer need an exemption. You no longer need a special permit. And now Swiss Medic will be in charge, that is the Swiss regulator for medicine, and they will in future grant operating permits for producers so that these producers can grow medical cannabis and also permits for this medical cannabis to be sold and marketed. So this goes hand in hand with the uh, lifting of the ban on medical cannabis. And now, currently, or three weeks back, the implementation uh, regulations on medical cannabis were sent into the consultation process at a political level, and it becomes clear now what a legislator 
intent how here how they want to make sure that in future uh, cannabis drug products should be grown should be marketed should be sold and the legislator here opted for a permit system and as I said Swiss Med Medic will in future be in charge of granting respective permits. On the patient side or on the levy side they have opted for the formula magistralis concept. This is in summary a possibility to launch cannabis medication uh, in the market without any uh, market authorization. So here the doctor decides and the legislator does not decide under what conditions it can be prescribed and in what form. They know that there's simply not enough data available and they give the doctor freedom to treat. So, under due diligence conditions, the doctor needs to decide under what conditions he would like to prescribe cannabis. So as you all see, we are coming from the absolutely banned substance over the uh, controlled substance to a substance that becomes more and more available. And as a doctor, you can now prescribe cannabis drugs. So this was a rough summary of the current situation and the past developments. So the con political consultation process is still running and if you are all interested in contributing to this process, then please contact the relevant authorities and people. And now I'd like to open the discussion with my panelists who want to discuss the topic with me. And the first question goes to Krista. So, of course, you explained a little before already, but can you tell us again what the original, the initial motivation was to large a motion for the legalization of cannabis? Well, thank you very much. The hemp plant is a very multifaceted plant, and initially I was fighting for a legal review back in 2004. I was very new in Parliament and considered it a big defeat that the Parliament rejected that initiative. Then in 2008, I was part of the committee for the hemp initiative that was um, put to vote. And of course, it was a democratic process. You need to accept that. But what I didn't understand was that back then we didn't get an okay for the recreational use of hemp. And, and this is a paradox because you cannot protect the youth under a prohibition scheme. But that was one thing. And I thought, well, at least you should be able to use hemp for medical purposes. And a good friend of mine from my town, um, he produced his own hemp. And we discussed that the question of le legalization of recreational hemp should be split and separated from the question of medical hemp. And that's why I focused on medical hemp, also because neighboring countries were driving ahead with the legalization process, and Switzerland then was lagging a bit behind. There was a risk of losing that trend, because we can see it now. There's a new boom in this field. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for these explanations. So, Krista Markwalder launched a political motion, which in the end led to the review process of the current legislation. And at the same time, you can read 
uh, very often that the Federal Office of Public Health is rather happy that no special permits need to be granted anymore now. And uh, the number of special permits per year amounts to about 3,000 last year. Is that correct? And the Federal Office of Public Health always said that this number no longer reflects an exception if there are, is a need for medical cannabis um, with about 3,000 patients who need it or use it. So uh, Adrian Schwent is here representing the Federal Office of Public Health, and I found this argumentation quite good that the Federal Office of Public Health says now that these pure numbers have no longer anything to do with a special permit. So can we say that, okay, they've reached their goals, they no longer need to issue any special permits again in future. So was the actual motion the reason to your change in policy or was it an advantage that also the authorities said we need a change in par of paradigms here? Well, that's a rather technical question. Now, I don't know whether our audience really wants to know how the political processes went. But at the beginning, there was a motion by Mrs. Kessler, who wanted to check whether a pilot project could be conducted for medical purposes. And the Federal Council rejected that motion because um, they said it is not the state's task to promote the development of medication and the Federal Council then said we need a report on the situation and based on this report in 2018 the Federal Council then decided that the Narcotics Act should be amended. Mrs. Markwalder's motion and other motions were then taken up and the Health Committee of the National Council also became active. Mrs. Markwalder had demanded that the uh, growing of hemp should be allowed for medical purposes. And of course, an evaluation of these special permits um, was done. So that was all done by a university, not by the Federal Office of Public Health itself. And they found that, hey, if so many patients demand a special permit, it is no longer really an exception under the legal point of view. And it no longer reflects the societal reality to have these strict rules. So these were the different elements that played a role here. And of course, we are not unhappy if we do not need to decide upon individual patients at the office because we are way too far away from the patients. And of course, it is uh, something different with hallucinogenic substances. There we still can take a close look as the legislature demands, but with a uh, hand it was simply no longer realistic. Okay, thank you very much for these explanations. I just found that interesting because it's something that you don't see that often, that you get the impression that even an authority is in favor of changing the laws in this regard. And uh, this will have led to a consensus if even the administration says, no, we need to change the uh, current system, if the system is no longer modern. Well, of course, the authorities also need to make the politicians aware if a law no longer reflects the social reality and the state of research. Of course, the parliament makes the laws in the end, but uh, we also can do our part. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now let's talk about the results. So what we've discussed so far was more the 
history behind the recent changes, which from a legal point of view is always interesting. After all, all these legal uh, articles need to be interpreted in some way in future in favor or not of certain people. But now let's talk about the result. Rudolf, I would like to ask you, in the past, you intensively focused on the medical use of cannabis. Now, I've tried to give people an overview of what's going to happen in future. Are you satisfied with what the law says now or what they intend to write in the law? Well, I would like to mention the term cannabis dilemma here. This term comes from uh, Franjo Grotenum, the best known cannabis doctor in Europe. He lives in Germany. What is the cannabis dilemma? It is something that I'm confronted with on a daily basis through self-medication and self-therapy, patients often know more about the effects than the doctor in charge knows. And what the patients do there are no official studies. And some doctors even do not want to know because of the bureaucratic hurdles and building bridges between cannabis medicines and evidence-based medicine is something that's ne necessary. I come from the field of evidence-based medicine. I've been doing research for 40 years, and we need to build bridges here. And today, I also accept thoughts and findings and insights from experimental medicine, I would say, and I accept it if not everything is fully evidence-based. In the U.S., there is a patient organization called Patients Out of Time, and this is what provokes us in science. The patients come and say, we cannot wait until Swiss Medic grants market authorization. And this is why the change of law next year will really be a milestone. So what happens then? The people don't have support uh, by their doctor because the doctor doesn't want to do that. Uh, he finds it too delicate. And I mean, we are not reinventing the wheel. Um, cannabis as a remedy is thousands of years old. But we are lacking behind in science, and now we need to build bridges. And this is the task of this society that we founded last year. So we get the evidence, but we also get the anecdotes from experienced medicine. This is our task. OK, thank you very much for these explanations. Now, uh, Felix, Felix Eaton, so uh, you also take a rather results-oriented approach, and I think you also observed uh, accurately what is being done in Bern. Now, if you look at the planned results, are you, as a representative of a patient organization, happy with that? Well, we don't know yet, because patients who are being treated with hemp already, they have a broad range of products available on the black market, or they plant their own, or they buy via the internet. They know specifically which variety is good for what. And if we do not have a clear product range, it's difficult. So it's going to take some years uh, until we know more. This plant is so multifaceted and the uh, forms and formulations are so different. So we say, OK, the law is open enough. It can cover everything. But there's still some uncertainty there because, on the one hand, people fear that or they fear the price development and this 
was also one reason for a new law to fight the black market, because otherwise it wouldn't really solve the problem. And we are, we basically do not differentiate between medical cannabis and other cannabis. Basically, medical cannabis is just cleanly produced cannabis, but this should actually hold true for all varieties of cannabis being produced. So without any heavy metals in the ingredients and so on. But what the law doesn't sufficiently cover yet is the daily use, the everyday use. We call it the fennel tea. So for us, cannabis is of course something that needs to be locked in the um, medical cabinet, but also it should be something that you should have at home. And we do not need to talk about THC, CBD here, no. There are many home remedies that you take before going to see a doctor, and uh, this is something that we have always hoped could be offered to the public, and, and then the health insurance schemes wouldn't have to pay so much. I mean, what has been available so far with a special permit was so extremely expensive that people weren't really able to to afford that. And, and I do understand the health insurance schemes. Uh, what you can get here today is 20 times as expensive as what you can get on a market in a different countries. And we always send our patients to the doctors, told them, OK, tell the doctor how it works with the special permit, and so on and so forth. So they had the special permit just to protect themselves. So that if the police runs a check, that they can show it, um, really show, hey, I got that from my doctor. But in the end, they didn't really buy it via the pharmacy, but they planted their own hemp because why the pharmacy it was just too expensive. So we would like to see a broad range of products in the next few years. And the knowledge is there. And uh, doctors will now receive further training uh, this year. Uh, we had a first official further training session for doctors, because in the past, the doctors were a problem. They weren't allowed to focus on that. And, and also, they had nothing to prescribe. And if we see Germany, we see that this is a fast developing trend. So in Germany, uh, they've been offering cannabis in the pharmacies for five years now. And uh, what was seen there was that prices have decreased. And this is an important point here. And I'd like to uh, talk a bit about that, the special permit, the special prescription that you mentioned, the formula magistralis. And I looked at the draft text of the new law. And uh, what I see there is that in future, they will still use this formula magistralis system. Is that right, Adrian? Is that the concept that Switzerland will follow in future? And if so, why? No, actually, that's not true. Back in 2012, uh, the legislator said already that you have the special permit for medical use, and uh, the, uh, you could always have hemp that was specially produced for patients. And back then, it was also already possible that the pharmaceutical producer, so the pharmaceutical end industry, uh, could apply for market authorization with Swissmatic. And if they met the criteria regarding safety and quality and other points for such, 
drugs, you do not need a special permit. This has been the case for years. So the legislator back then assumed that the industry would, if um, drugs containing cannabinoids um, prove their worth, that the industry would apply for more and more special permits, which didn't actually happen. But these official prescriptions with these special permits, this combination, that is really uh, something that had been intended as an exception. And in the Remedies Act, this is also a last resort because their experience, knowledge that Rudolf Brandeisen mentioned can be considered. So it is possible that a doctor says, okay, we do not have enough empirical evidence that would be sufficiently back, so clinical evidence that is, but we do have anecdotal evidence and we will just try it as a remedy. However, if you want to receive market authorization for a product, then society expects that the efficacy and safety checks have been done. And the requirements must be even higher for remuneration by the health insurance schemes, because we, as citizens, do not want to pay for something where there's no proof that it is effective. But if the patient and doctor decide we should use it on a, an experimental basis. This should be possible, and the new law will make that possible now. And of course, we continue to hope that companies will apply for market authorization so that they stick to the regulatory processes and that uh, products will be launched in the market that the health insurance schemes will remunerate. And I mean, under certain conditions, uh, you always you already get remuneration already, but the market authorization, that's something like a prerequisite for remuneration. Okay, thank you very much for these explanations. But I've got one more question. In this room, there are a few members of producing companies who would love to produce cannabis medicine. They may have high-tech tools, high-track apparatuses to do that, they have the knowledge, and they would be able to produce pharmaceutical-grade cannabis products, so they will have the technology or will acquire the technology. So how exactly can this be combined with this formula magistralis? I do assume that the patients would wish to see cannabis medication available that is produced um, under certain uh, medical standards, so that really what you uh, read on the label is really in there, down to the last microgram. Does that go in line with this formula administralis? So can now the producers produce a tincture, for instance, and the doctor can prescribe the string tincture, and the patient then goes to the pharmacy to get this specific drug? Well, uh, a finished drug is defined by law, and I'm not a specialist in that. But maybe we can say that a medicine for which you have market authorization, there's a guarantee that it is safe and effective. And with this formula magistralis, the state doesn't provide this guarantee. There, it's really the doctor's responsibility to say, OK, let's try it out. But this doesn't mean that these products do not need to meet high standards and requirements. Of course they do. No matter if it is a narcotic or not, there are good production practices. This is a uh, concept uh, that you need to stick to. And this holds true for this drugs and substances, no matter 
affect whether they are being produced at the pharmacy itself or with a contract manufacturer somewhere else. So that doesn't matter. They all need to meet certain standards. And this entire procedure of the uh, Formula Magistralis is thought to be a special permit because every pharmacy must be able to prove to the continental pharmacist that they have a need to produce that. However, a contract manufacturer can produce for different pharmacies, but here production is limited to about 3,000 units. That is what the Medicines Act says. The Medicines Act goes farther here, but this also holds true for other um, products. I just do not want to convey the impression that the Federal Council wanted to do that, even though we do not have any products of market authorization. No. We want to make it possible for patients to benefit from the products only. We do not have a safety guarantee provided by Swiss Medic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Rudolf, I am sure that you also have an idea how that works with the official prescriptions. Is that uh, the right way to go? Or um, is that a good development? Uh, to um, give the responsibility to the pharmacist, or shouldn't we rather give the responsibility to the producers? Well, I think the current solution is the compromise until we have the new laws implemented. I mean, regulatory proceedings, that's a different league. So uh, the only product with um, official market authorization in Switzerland, this mouth spray, there the industry invested hundreds of millions. And this is the first uh, CBT THC standardized cannabis extraction that was authorized for sale in Switzerland. And that's an entirely different leak. So what a pharmacist learns during his studies is how to prepare that at a pharmacy. And there are very few pharmacists in Switzerland who want to work with cannabis. And of course, then you can buy tinctures or oils. And for me, it's important. Uh, something that is pharmacologically active needs to have the right quality. You must be able to know how many active agents are in there, what the side effects are. These are the basic principles of therapy, not only when it comes to cannabis. And we do have a problem with the flowers. And I know that people won't like to hear that, but there is a certain um, there's a certain variation, degree of variation that is acceptable when it comes to flowers. And nature is very variable. And now if the flower is seen as a medication in the pharmacy, then we might get problems here. For me, the flower is the ideal raw material for producing medicine in the pharmacy. That's great. Then GMP, good manufacturing practices, plays a role here. Everything needs to be standardized to ensure quality. But this official prescription under special permit, this is currently the only way to go. Uh, so that we get to where we want to. And we are working on finding new ways to get cannabis into the body uh, in a safe way and efficient way. So we know that the liver doesn't like 
cannabinoids destroys most of it. So uh, inhaling via the lungs, would that be an option? And based on nanotechnology, we are developing a product that uh, can also be marketed in the form of a water-soluble mouth spray. So we need modern research and we need investors for that because this is, again, an entirely different, different league here. So this uh, official prescription is a good first step to build bridges. Okay, thank you very much for these. Uh, explanations. This formula magistral is maybe something entirely new for many people, so thank you uh, for giving us more insights on that. Now, Lino, as a representative of Pure Holding here, I'd like to learn what you think about that. So, uh, new permits granted by Swiss Medic will be necessary in the future. Are these uh, now uh, requirements that are okay for a producer or does that lead to additional cost or does that make the product extremely expensive? Well, basically, I can say that any form of regulation that leads to an improvement of the status quo is a welcome one, especially if 100,000 patients come out of uh, criminality, you can speak. And if we then talk about drugs with controlled substances and the narcotics control regulation, it is understandable that we're active here in a very controlled area, whereas CBD is entirely uncontrolled. Whether cannabis at the end of the day will be entered into segments A, B, or C of the uh, medicines register is something we could discuss at length, but for a producer like us, it doesn't really matter. We can all implement it, but I do fear that the high requirements will lead to additional costs for the patients, and if patients buy or continue to buy unregulated products from the black market, regulation will have failed. So this is actually the point. So what will the health insurance schemes pay for? How expensive will the products be? And will the new regulation lead to costs that are so high that patients need to continue to buy from the black market? Okay, thank you very much. Now building bridges to pharmaceutical research, and this is something that the authorities hope will happen through legalization. I'd like to ask you, Krista, you uh, talked about a high-tech plant in a previous presentation. Now, do you know in what direction research might go in future? Well, this is a question that you better ask the pharmacists and researchers in the panel, because I, this is good what I learn here, things that I can feed back into politics. Okay, then uh, I'm going to ask Lino again. Uh, can you say something about research? Well, we are only at the beginning of understanding this plant, and this is something that I am so enthused about regarding the work of Pure Gene. Within a few years, we can catch up, um, catch up because now we have much more freedom to do research, and this will lead to lots of innovations. Cannabis medicine has so far never been part of the curriculum at universities, and in 10 years' time, we will have a new generation of doctors who was trained without the previous stigma, and the new findings from research will also be important for us so that we can optimize breeding and growing we can um tailor the plants to uh, the needs. So we are talking about personal 
law is cannabis medicine in future. Thank you very much for that. It'll be interesting to see what's going to come. So you have heard it. We are trying to build bridges with the scheme that currently exists, Formula Magistralis, in order to bring research ahead. I personally still have lots and lots of questions. We have high caliber speakers here today. Theoretically, we had announced that we would also allow questions from the audience. Do we have time for that? Yes, we do. So, um, are there any people in the audience who would like to ask questions? Over there. Second row. Sorry, where was that? So everything's sanitized, don't worry. <laughs> well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a legal question. Article 8 of the Narcotics Act states that cannabis continues to be a forbidden plant as the only plant in the entire Narcotics Act. Wouldn't it be time for the Parliament to get that out of this law? So uh, to make sure it's no longer a forbidden plant? Adrian, would you like to answer that question? I think that was a clear question to the politician here. I mean, they underline for medical use, and this is the new law that was announced here, which will most likely come into force next year in August. But you are now talking about the overall situation, the non-medical use, and here I need to ask Krista Mick Markwalde. Okay. I I think it really makes sense, yes. So oh, prohibition policies when it comes to cannabis consumption, no matter whether for medical or recreational use, have failed. Prohibition has failed. And so far in the parliament and in the wider public. We have never really found majorities for that, but we are approaching that. We have more and more findings on the use of cannabis for medical purposes. Society is developing, and I think uh, at some point, maybe sooner rather than later, this term will be taken out of the Narcotics Act. And I personally like it if you can take something out of uh, a law rather than regulating something new. <laughs> well, maybe I can add something here. I think later on we are going to talk about these pilot projects with cannabis. So. I'd like to talk about the Federal Council's perspective on that. It doesn't mean that if you take the prohibition out of the law uh, that everything would be totally liberalized. Usually if you take something out of the law, you regulate again. The question is to what extent you regulate it. So far, out of all the countries who have legalized the use, they have regulated it nevertheless and have stricter regulations than what we currently have for alcohol and tobacco in Switzerland. And the Federal Council says, okay, we should first wait for this pilot project, see what is well uh, established and proven. And there's a consensus in uh, the population. We had a representative study on that, a study on regulation, and the study was published in June 2021. And everybody says the status quo is not satisfactory, but what people actually want is still the question. And here, the nuances will then come into play. So you can talk about an entirely free market where you can do entirely without youth protection, where you can do advertising and everything up to a strictly regulated market. And that will be an interesting political discussion. And this vision doesn't yet exist. I mean, doing away with prohibition um, entirely doesn't make sense. But of course, we do not know yet where we're headed. 
Okay, thank you very much for these explanations. I hope that your question is now answered. Now we have another question over there. Ja, mein Name ist Arno, ich komme aus den Niederlanden. Ich spreche Englisch, weil ich äh, in Deutsch in der Schule nicht so gut aufgepasst habe. Ich äh, sitze neben einem Kollegen aus Italien. Wir waren in unterschiedlichen Ländern, wo man Cannabis legalisieren möchte. Und wir, ich habe das Gefühl, die Diskussion ist immer das Gleiche. Politiker wollen Regulierung haben, Forscher wollen klinische Studien und Qualität haben, Patienten wollen die Wahl haben zu Preis die sie sich leisten können. Also wir alle wollen ja eigentlich Informationen und Forschung. Und jedes Land macht das auf seine eigene Art und Weise. Schweizer Produkte, Schweizer Forschung, Schweizer Regulierung. Und natürlich verstehe ich, wo das herkommt. Aber meine Frage ist, was braucht es oder war, wie bemühen Sie sich von anderen Ländern zu lernen? Kurse, Produkte, Forschung. Einige Länder machen das seit 20 Jahren. Holland und Kanada zum Beispiel, wie versuchen Sie hier an diese Informationen ranzukommen, damit man in der Schweiz schneller Fortschritte machen kann? Herzlichen Dank. Ja, danke für diese Frage. Es uh, ist jetzt schwierig, die Frage weiterzuleiten. Well, may I say something? This affects politics. It also affects research. I will answer in German. So research does, of course, look beyond borders. We from the authorities are in very close contact with the Dutch authorities. Pilot trials are being looked at. Also, die versuchen dort das Problem mit der Hintertür in den Niederlanden anzuschauen. We are in very close contact with the Canadian authorities, the authorities in Uruguay, so we are exchanging insights. We do not yet have the solution from a public health perspective, but we can benefit a lot from these experiences. I mean, when it comes to medicine, many countries are far ahead of Switzerland, Israel, for instance, and we're taking a close look at that. And every year we summarize the findings from all over the world. But for the recreational use, there we are still in our infancy and we do not have that many findings yet. Of course, we can learn a lot from the alcohol and tobacco policy and we do so in Switzerland and abroad. Okay, you've said that the recreational use. You should say that please differentiate between medical and non-medical use. The non-medicational use, whether you call it recreational or not, has nothing to do with a medical clinical study. People keep confusing that. And here we have a consensus with the Federal Office of Public Health and my society because the medical consensus is something that you will always get. But these pilot projects, I have nothing against it, but I am really against making the pharmacies the place of logistics for these flowers. You're nodding your head, but not everyone agrees with that. So I favor the Klumpf model. I went to Oregon, went to Uruguay, looked at that. I linked my holidays with business in Uruguay. They call themselves pharmacies, but they are not actually pharmacies. They have a know-how that is for bigger than many of my colleagues have. And here we have a big problem. We hope that the revised law will come, but the front is not ready for that. Neither the doctors nor the pharmacists are ready for this legal change. And here, if I may say so, uh, we need to educate the people through workshops, through guidelines that we are developing for the Federal Public of Public Health. And when I left the university in 2014, the university didn't replace myself. I had had a professorship for cannabis. So uh, this is 
they said it was because of the funding. They didn't have the funding. And we will now integrate an interdisciplinary curriculum at the University of Bern with medicine students and pharmacists included. You need to start from that low level to make everyone ready for the revised law. And I don't think this is going to work at the front. People are not ready for that. Ja, herzlichen Dank für diese Ausführungen. Ich hoffe, Ihre Frage wurde damit so gut wie möglich beantwortet. Wir haben noch eine Frage. Thank you very much. I would like to know, when it comes to the producer's side, how interesting is Switzerland as a hub here? Uh, do companies have a competitive advantage in Switzerland compared with the EU countries or overseas? And my second question is, how about sales markets? What sales markets do you see as especially interesting markets? That is a question to Lino Gerigetti. Well, I think that when it comes to the production hop, here to, uh, the CBD market used to be entirely unregulated. With THC, we now have a strongly regulated market, so I do think that the Swiss production will be important. Regarding the sales markets, I can say the first priority as a Swiss company, we would like to serve the Swiss market, but also other markets that are liberalized, Germany, Israel. And I do believe that Switzerland is playing a pioneering role in Europe, and that's good. But in the next few years, more markets will follow. As we've seen in the US, uh, there was this domino effect where one federal state after the other started regulating. And this is also something that we can expect in Europe. And it's important that we have a grown conscience in Switzerland, grown awareness, both in politics and the federal, public of, uh, federal Office of Public Health. They want to assume responsibility. They want to play a pioneering role here in order to be a leader in European countries cannabis policies.